Bless you. So welcome to the town council's uh, workshop. Tonight's workshop is on Complete Streets for Scarborough. I want to welcome everyone that's here. Uh, we do have uh, the members of the town council and the transportation committee and others. And uh, maybe for the cameras, if we can go around the table and introduce. I did want to at least um, explain a couple of absences. Uh, Chairman um, Bill Donovan is out of town had a pre-scheduled appointment or pre-scheduled event in Florida, and um, <laughs> Council St. Clair had to call in her absence uh, for another appointment as well. So I uh, wish them the best, but uh, we'll get started. If you can just go around the table so everyone knows who's who. Sure. Uh, Tom Paul, Town Manager. Uh, Roger Bailey, Planning Board. Uh, Will Rowan, uh, Town Council. Jean Marie Katarina, Council. Mike Shaw, Public Works. Angela Blanchett, Town Engineer. Susan Oswald, Planning Board. Drew Bray, I'm on the Transportation Committee. Jennifer Ladd, Transportation Committee. Karen Martin, Scott Economic Development Corporation. Uh, Chris Chiazzo, Town Council. Uh, Dan Bacon, Planning Director. Uh, Peter Hayes, Town Council. Glad to be here. Carol Ryan Court, uh, uh, Transportation Committee. Sean Devine, Town Council. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, very and quickly. Uh, in, uh, in conversation with Chairman Donovan, we thought we'd he really was committed to doing workshops, and this is the kind of uh, opportunity uh, that staff looks forward to, an opportunity to kind of advance an idea, things that your committees have been working on and staff's thinking about. Really an opportunity to introduce the notions to you. Uh, there's no action that's uh, anticipated, although we do have some projects in design that these concepts are kind of being tossed around, namely the Guam Road reconstruction project is a great example of that. So it would be great uh, once Dan gets through uh, a bit of a brief presentation to really open it up for dialogue. And the folks around this table are uh, really involved in one way or another in this discussion. And with uh, Vice Chair uh, Dayline's uh, permission, I'd love to invite everyone to be part of that conversation so we can get a flavor of uh, you know how this sounds. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dan Bacon and he'll walk us yeah. through some of the basic principles. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, as Tom introduced, the, the Transportation Committee has actually been working on the kind of a notion of complete streets for, I think, since their existence. So they were established three or four years ago as a, a needed committee to kind of focus on transportation and um, complete streets is, is really kind of uh, been a focus in terms of trying to have <coughs> roadways and streets be more than just kind of conduits of cars, um, but rather also serve other users. So I have a quick PowerPoint just to, to kind of go through at a high level what complete streets are intended um, to be, who they're intended to serve, and some examples of what the Transportation Committee looked at, what the town's done, you know, separate from the Transportation Committee or, in, or prior to, and really as sort of a backdrop. And then, as Tom in introduced, this meeting is more about everyone kind of asking questions and, and kind of talking through uh, the details of it. So I don't want this to be a long presentation. Um, and I think the Transportation Committee's kind of end goal is to present to you at an available uh, council meeting an actual policy that you'd adopt as a council um, so that the town thinks about complete streets when they do projects in a, on a consistent basis. Um, so with that, I'll quickly go through this. Um, we should mention there are slides. Yeah. There are the slides that look like the major circulation. We're making all done. Yeah. Good there. Um, <laughs> and so complete streets aren't a, they're really not a new concept, um, not a new thing to Scarborough, but it's new to kind of bring forward a policy around them. And they're, they're really designing streets and, and gearing streets with all users in mind, um, not just the automobile or, or trucks, um, but also walkers, um, bicyclists. Um, to some degree in Scarborough, transit riders, um, you know, other users and other folks uh, besides the automobile and, and drivers. The, the vision and purpose and kind of goals around complete streets is to provide really kind of greater independence for different segments of our population. The really young and the really old often can't rely on automobiles for transportation. So um, really providing mo mobility and, and, and transportation choices and options for 
everyone in our, computer, in our community. And also those that have a car and able to drive may want to ride a bike or walk to a destination. So creating more opportunities for those choices to be made when there's, there's streets that are kind of complete and safe and designed in a way that is conducive to that. Um, active lifestyles and quality of life are, is another kind of vision and purpose of complete streets. If there's a safe, um, good place to exercise, um, more people will likely do that or uh, have an alternative way of getting around. Another piece of complete streets is, is having a better connected or a well connected kind of road network. That's something that I think Scarborough uh, has struggled with over the years and really needs to focus on now that we've you know, we're constantly looking at how do we add a few lanes here or there to make an intersection work a little bit more. And we're getting to the end of being able to do that, given we've widened probably as much as we can widen in some places. So thinking about alternative road connections for cars, but also for bikes and pedestrians, um, and, you know, more interconnections can kind of help relieve some of those intersection challenges and relieve our primary roads from the amount of traffic that you get and, and more evenly distribute traffic and, and also other ways of moving around, um, bikes and pets and et cetera. And that kind of gets to congestion relief. Which, um, and are you going to come back and explain, and explain that a little bit further? I guess I'd be curious what, what that would look like. Um, well, I mean, when a subdivision is coming in or the town thinking about a transportation improvement, um, in the past, there wasn't a lot of thought given to connecting neighborhoods. Um, instead, somebody comes in and they put in a dead end road. It's not connected to the to the neighboring street. So everybody in that setting, you know, relies on the main road to get around. So Broad Turn Road is sort of the poster child, I would say, in Scarborough for uh, a major collector, a main road that everyone has to use who lives off of it because neighborhood streets aren't interconnected. So there's not a good connection out to Holmes Road or Mitchell Hill Road or, you know, neighboring roads to have choices in which way you go. And so that really often overloads that one collector road or main road and then overloads the intersection that you have to go through because you couldn't go a different way. So um, I think we've made some gains in that recently with some subdivisions and some town initiatives, um, but there's more opportunity for that to kind of, as an alternative to widening, widening intersections or widening a main road, can you connect to other main roads um, to, to prevent that? Okay, thank you. Discover is a, a pretty diverse community in terms of setting. Um, you know, we have our commercial centers, we have a wide range of kind of residential areas. We have industrial areas. We have rural areas. It's a really interesting town in terms of the different types of settings we have and different types of roads. So Complete Streets is really intended to be more of a philosophy, not a design manual. So um, I don't think the Transportation Committee expects every road to have a sidewalk and a bike lane and sort of look and, and function the same way, but rather look at the context of the roadway or the, the location and then um, then decide what the design is. Is it a sidewalk in Oak Hill? Is it just a widened shoulder in the more rural areas because it really isn't the pedestrians or the bike traffic or the population to justify a more expensive uh, improvement or whatever the setting might be. So kind of thinking about the improvements and matching it up with the context it's located in. Some recent efforts that I think we would consider being kind of complete streets initiatives would be Black Point Road, added a sidewalk from Oak Hill down to the Eastern Trail um, and that provided important kind of pedestrian connection and sort of completed the street scenario in that location. Pine Point Road and a similar sidewalk was improved um, in the Dunson area. Route 1 sidewalks have been added incrementally um, a lot over the last five or ten years to, to round out um, the opportunities for kind of transportation along Route 1. In Dunstan, when 
major vehicular improvements were made, sidewalks were also added, crosswalks were added. Um, we're now looking at some bus shelter locations in that area, given there's now a critical mass of um, activity in, in the Dunstan area. So those are examples of some past initiatives. Um, a different but just as good example uh, is the Pleasant Hill Road project that Mike um, spearheaded over the last couple of years. Now the section of Pleasant Hill Road from Route 1 to Highland Avenue is <coughs> largely industrial, but also has a residential um, area by Highland Avenue. So the shoulders were widened to enable accommodations for trucks, but also bikes. Um, we added a bike path in an area that the Eastern Trail will connect to in the, hopefully the near future um, and connect to the neighborhood. So there's some pedestrian accommodations there as part of that project. And also, I mentioned kind of an industrial part of Pleasant Hill Road and residential part of Pleasant Hill Road. Mike and FST, the designer, kind of narrowed up the shoulders as you come into the residential area to, again, respond to kind of the context there and to be sensitive to that because you didn't need quite as wide shoulders because there's less truck traffic in that area, but you mm -hmm. want wider shoulders enough for, for the bike activity um, and pedestrian use. So that's a, it's a pretty good project of being context sensitive just within the same corridor. Um, and lastly, there's some pedestrian improvements planned for Oak Hill that are trying to make it just a little bit more pedestrian friendly and a little bit safer for those that try to move around the Oak Hill intersection. Um, and that's coupled with some safety improvements for, for motorists given some high crash locations there. So um, those have been approved by the council in past years and uh, hopefully can get off the ground this year if we get better pricing on the, on the project than last year. So in terms of sort of deficiencies and needs, I mean those are some good good examples of what we've worked on recently, um, but there's a lot of other kind of needs that um, we see justifies a policy. Um, the Gorham Road project, as Tom mentioned, is underway. We've had some really good turnout and kind of positive energy around how Gorham Road could become a more complete street with some sidewalks, with uh, wider shoulders in some places, maybe even rather than a sidewalk, a wider bike ped surface that um, could serve all the residential areas along Gorham Road and, and off Gorham Road. And that process is underway and will be, I'm sure, presented to the council once there's a, uh, a preliminary design that's um, fully complete. Uh, Pine Point Road and East Grand Avenue, that area of town, I know is on kind of Mike's list for improvements in the future for, for drainage and road improvements, road surface improvements, but it's also an area that has a lot of summertime bike pedestrian activity, a lot of different kind of users. Um, so there's great opportunity in that area to, to use the width of the road and the right of way and, and do more than just uh, repave that area, but to, to complete um, the improvements down there. We were talking earlier a bit about interconnections and kind of mm -hmm. trying to plan our road network a bit better. So Oak Hill and Dunstan are areas that we really can kind of look at that and master plan in the next few years. There's opportunity in, in Dunstan to maybe connect a road from Payne Road over to Broadturn Road. To, that also could be a development access road, but could relieve um, the Dunstan Corner intersection. Oak Hill, there's some opportunities for similar things. So. Again, looking at those for traffic congestion, but also other other modes is pretty important. Um, transit accommodations, we are continue to dip our toe into being more transit friendly and, and looking at bus shelters and making it just more widely known that we have transit service. I don't know that many <coughs> residents or business owners realize that there is a fair amount of bus service in Scarborough, and if we had accommodations that made it safer and easier and more appealing, mm -hmm. then that could um, propel transit ridership. Um, and so the last bullet there is, is consistency, and that's a pretty open-ended statement, but it's, I think, with a policy, 
Um, we can be more consistent in terms of always remembering to look at complete streets when there's a CIP project, when there's a new development that comes in, when there's a change in terms of transportation, whatever that um, complete street happens to be for that particular part of town. Um, so to consistently remember it and consistently consider <coughs> those other modes is pretty important and that's what the policy is all about, to, to think about it more than just a road for cars. And you, you mentioned a CIP, can you explain what that is? Sorry, that's a, <laughs> um, insider terms, a uh, capital improvement project. So anytime the town does a new road project or um, other infrastructure improvement, that's Budget season, you'll learn that term. Too well. Yeah. All right, I'm looking forward yeah, to that. Is capital. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of the policy, and, and you all should have copies of what the transportation committee is offering for consideration. Um, but at a high level, it's you know really a statement to kind of look at complete streets um, when projects come along. CIPs, um, Mike and his, his department does a lot of kind of road rehabilitation projects where they get repaved and looking at, okay, should we add a little shoulder? Should we do something a bit differently than we, rather than just repaving the, the current footprint or, or current design of the road? Retrofitting roads, that, that means um, modifying roads in a way to add new amenities or to kind of retrofit them into to something else. Maybe you add on street parking or you add a, a bike lane or you do something different. Um, new developments, you know, the planning board and Rogers planning board sees new roads pretty often through uh, new subdivisions, uh, in some cases commercial projects. So looking at that road design and, and considering whether um, it takes into account different modes. I mentioned earlier, you know, kind of road network planning for those congested areas and, and other areas, um, and through subdivision review, you know, looking for opportunities for interconnected neighborhoods. There's great opportunities of that through the planning board process. Um, and I was being kind of sensitive to the road and sort of land use context where where you are in town. Um, and how many people the road's going to serve, and what's the what's realistic in terms of those improvements. Um, so that's really kind of the, the high level of what a complete street's intended to be, and what the benefits can be, and and how it can help us in Scarborough. And um, I think there's really some opportunity with continuing on the path we've been on for a while to continue to make Scarborough really a more livable place if we provide more choices um, in terms of transportation, have more amenities for bike and pedestrian use, and can really reduce congestion or provide alternatives and have some safety benefits, some health benefits, and, and also, you know, play a role in a greater community feel. You know, you add sidewalks, you add facilities like that, there's more people interacting with each other. I think, mm -hmm. you know, the Eastern Trail is a great example of that. It's, it's a more linear um, destination. It's not necessarily connected to everybody's neighborhood, but there's a lot of um, interactions that occur along the Eastern Trail that wouldn't if you didn't have that facility. Right. And having that in additional places in town, I think, would benefit mm -hmm. the community as a whole. So uh, that's what I have from a kind of a high level standpoint and one uh, hopefully that helps spur some conversation. So, excellent. Um, questions, comments, anybody? Yep. Me. Go ahead, <laughs> um, I'm glad to see this because um, I prefer to see a proactive approach, obviously, to transportation issues in particular. For those of you who don't know, I live on 114, going up through North Scarborough, which is horrific. Uh, at times, um, as far as transportation, uh, excuse me, traffic and whatnot, uh, volume. I'm one of these people who likes to walk, and when you say you'd like to see them, I'd love to see sidewalks in rural areas, to be honest with you. And I've had people say to me when I knock on doors and whatever, 
but I obviously get it. I mean, we don't, it's not an unlimited pile of money for that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm assuming, well, let me ask this. I shouldn't assume anything. Are you guys interacting with PACs at all, uh, in particular with North Scarborough? Because you know the North Scarborough initiative yeah. that's going on, and is the Transportation Committee We've been aware of that? We've or attended some of those meetings. Okay. Judy, I know you Judy know. has, yeah. I'm not going to do a library just a little bit. Oh, when you get up past my house towards Gorham, uh, where 22 and Gorham come together, it's a, that's, tr that's tr terrible. That mm -hmm. whole area in North Scarborough is at, at uh, I avoid it in the morning to the night. That is 3.30 and they, they back up almost to my house, which is a couple right. miles. Route 22 comes out of Portland. Yeah. It's just a bottleneck. And, uh, yeah. So well, we're we met with the residents on two occasions, right. which we tend to do when we're looking at, you know, uh, what we'd like to do with an area and trying to glean from the people there what right. they'd like to see their that neighborhood look like. There are mm. certainly the right. extremes. Some say, leave it alone, don't do right. anything, but others see the need right. for some upgrade. And, and we're trying to so. we're trying to get the turnpike to look at a bypass. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the whole other ball of wax. But that being said, one of the the, uh, the things that have, has been presented is one, uh, one of these complete streets mm -hmm. <laughs> efforts to develop North Scarborough so we can go back to the Army Corps of Engineers and say, no, you're not making Gorham Road a four-lane road because that's what they they would like mm -hmm. us to do. Yeah. And, and I'm like, over my dead body, I don't think so. Was at our last yes. meeting and encouraged the folks that live in the North Capital area to communicate with the powers that be because the, the state doesn't want to do a bypass because they don't think it's needed or they're not getting that message and so what it's really important well, to the Army the Corps, residents yeah. Yeah, to get that message to them that yeah we are Peter will do it and but they need not to you Peter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. so, I think we're due to meet again fairly soon with yes that, with that group I haven't so, heard his date so, yeah but anyway would we help you understand with that though uh, is that a is that a legislative contingent effort or is that specifically with the, with the Army Corps of Engineers I mean what the the barrier the to doing a bypass that. if the neighborhood people see the need there, and that, is that something that has to be legislated, or is that something that goes through DOTs? Oh, it's a huge bureaucracy. I know the process, I'm just saying, if, 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 the, if the need isn't percolating up no. through to the right levels, is this it's not legislated. It's not a legislative. No. That, that right. can't, we can't get support or assistance that way. Well, I basically right now, right. there is a, you know, some concept drawings. So right. But uh, what, what Peter is saying is that we need to demonstrate to uh, Army Corps and DOT, who all play a part in it, that th we are working on a plan uh, for the future. And, you know, so it's not something... It doesn't include... Yeah. And uh, yeah. so that's the message we need to... You know, so I was just curious of the Transportation Committee's tie-in with that, because it's obviously it's not just North Scarborough. I, I'm, Whenever I work on anything like this, I'm not looking at just now. I'm not even looking at 10 years from now. I'm looking down 30 years from now. Right. Because Scarborough's gone has changed so much since I've lived in Scarborough. In the late 80s is when I moved to Scarborough, and Scarborough has changed tremendously even in that brief period of time. Um, so mm -hmm. and your GP Cog rep representative should be also a member of the transit that's me. Yeah, that's you. That's and me. so you know, attending those meetings right. and staying on top because they get in a lot of amount. Usually, 13 million has been the number I think we've gotten recently on an annual basis to work on various and sundry transportation issues and problems. It's uh, they've got you know they got to prioritize them. There's this long list and it might be 25th right. on the list. Like you could have everything all lined up. And Absolutely. No funding and so well, that's anyway. the issue. Active funding. involvement of the time. council rep yeah. to the GP cause and the tax committee is certainly important. And Dan, I know, has served on the tax mm -hmm. committee, and so uh, we keep keep yeah. touching base with that. And, and are we doing any outreach with Gorm? Because it sounds like yeah. it would be. Yeah, yeah we're working with Gorm. It was a okay. it was a meeting in tandem with Gorm and okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an ongoing thing. But I was just curious about. That. Um, it'll be within a month that we're going to hear again from the main yeah. Mike Shorty. That's what I thought. Okay, good. Okay. I just wanted to say that 
it, you sort of look at it historically, um, the council that, one of the councils that Sean and Judy and I served on, we had an unofficial, semi-official, but it wasn't codified anywhere, plan for streets that whenever we redid a street, right. we give it as would give as much shoulder. Right. Because we knew we couldn't, to your point of not having sidewalks everywhere, but having a safe shoulder right. in, the, in the more rural areas if, that right. people could actually bike or walk on that would make that safe. I think having this policy mm. helps us to assure mm -hmm. that all of that yeah. will actually be Every codified project. for the first time, that we have to look for those solutions. Yeah. Uh, and of course, go m much more so with sidewalks and real bike paths right. in areas where um, they're needed. They're, you know, right. The congestion requires them. Right. And I think all of the villages in Scarborough have their own form of congestion. Yes. So right. those are the targets I think that we've looked at first. Yep. But that doesn't mean, for example, we we made some recommendations to the council before you two got on, but fairly recently about a Payne Road and um, Holmes Road yeah. intersection, oh, right. which is more rural, mm -hmm. but was an issue. So there are there are many things that the, the Transportation Committee is working on, okay. is looking at, you know, for in the long range. Yeah. 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 Um, it's wonderful. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a couple of thoughts when it comes to um, planning board involvement in this. Um, <coughs> this is wonderful because an enormous amount of work that's gone into this. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be, it's not going to be codified. I mean, how, I'm a little confused as to what's going to happen at the planning board level. Are we going to be able to, are we going to have ordinances that say exactly how much we can ask and how much we, we can't? Um, we're going to review this. That's a lot of work that has to be done in terms of figuring out how it is that it's actually going to come down to the implementation part. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in particular about the designing part. I remember what happened when we did our design standards for, for, um, <coughs> for, me, for architectural and, and um, site plan usage. And um, this will impact all of that as well, obviously. So that would be one of my points to look at real closely is how is it going to be when lower hits the road, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> right, currently we do have, you know, our zoning ordinance is pretty robust in terms of expecting sidewalks and certain things, right. but our street acceptance ordinance, that's the street acceptance mm. ordinance is uh, basically a design manual for when you do in a subdivision, you're putting in a new street. Um, that is fairly out of date, so, uh -huh. I think if anywhere, that's an area that needs attention in terms of coming out of this policy. I mean, this policy is more of a resolution, a statement by the community, we want to work in this direction. Other things flow from there. Right. You know, that then says so the planning point. staff work on your subdivision ordinance or your street acceptance okay. ordinance, and that would be something that comes later. So this is essentially just sort of like a, a wish list. It's more of a high level view. I, I mean yeah, I understand that, but it's got things in here, for example, under three F. Under exception. Yeah, under exception. Um town staff or town I'm going to be in the project due to the excessive and disproportionate cost of establishing the bike road walkway of transit improvement. You know, those kinds of things are going to be are going to be real tricky. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I think of things like our um, traffic impact fee that we have for mm -hmm. development. <coughs> Maybe mm -hmm. just throwing it out there that this is something that can be put in there as well. Is impact fee for um, the actual design. If it's, in other words, I would like to think that we would not exempt a project that was really going to serve the town because of the, the excessive or disproportionate cost. That would be tricky. Mm -hmm. So. And what does that mean? Well, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just putting, I'm just putting it out there mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of it might be something to think about in terms of putting out a fee for doing this. Well. I mean, to me, looking at this as a first blush and not having the background that many of you guys do with planning and, and things, and the exceptions are big enough you could drive a truck through them. It seems very much 
um, kind of no, sort no of going for trucks. So yeah, <laughs> no going for trucks. Uh, very very subjective. Which is I mean I don't I don't have necessarily have a problem with that. It's just my question is always if you're gonna if you're gonna codify it or you're gonna make it rigid and, and have rules then I think those exceptions either need to be tightened up a little bit or we really need to have some serious discussions about scope of what we try to cover what we're not trying to cover. So I think as first blush, I think it's a great it's a great concept piece of yeah. where we'd like to see go. And I think to your point, I think it would take a lot of work to hone it down if we want to move in the direction of policy, I, I would think. But yeah. that's just and, and it written as a policy, it's open for change at any right. time without right. you know a, a major is to use those standards as resources when we develop our local standards for um, bike lanes and sidewalks and things that we have we still to do on the list. We make that a little clearer that okay. those references are intended to be kind yeah. of guideposts as opposed to yeah. hard and fast design yeah. standards. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, yeah. isn't this primarily directed towards um, farmer and road roadways and not like neighborhoods per se? I mean, there's some there's some components of this that would apply to a neighborhood. But I think primary roadways are going to be the bulk of projects that Public Works, at least, is going to be working on. I yeah. mean, a lot of this is directed at capital projects, yeah. um, where the town's doing a project and there's an opportunity to do a little bit more. Now, okay, now where the developer's going to go in and well, I think that's a piece of it, but this right, is as much a statement about when the council decides to do a project or Mike decides to do a project. Right. Um, yeah. Maple Maple Avenue in Elmhurst is an example. Right. It's yeah. an older neighborhood, and we yeah. did sidewalks yeah. and crosswalks, and uh, you know because of the traffic issue. Yeah. yeah. As an example, Cousin Hill Road, Shape versus Gunstock, where I live. I mean, I. Think you know, th you're not going to have sidewalks and all that stuff there. Right. You no, know, but Pleasant Hill Road would be a different story. Right. Because it's more of a, a primary road, you know, it, it's where everybody feeds onto it. Any but but it's contrast to right. connect to right. parks or right. to the yeah. Yeah. Pleasant Hill Preserve, you know, right. destinations that you And remember, there's a safety component here, places. so yeah. there would be an assessment of the safety risk. Yeah. So Gunstock isn't going to get a high safety risk analysis, but Black Point Road by the uh, Oak Hill Cisco gets a very high safety right. risk mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. So all that plays into this. Well, but what about but what about new development? Same thing. I mean, I think we're talking, new developments are going to, are really on a, to me, are, they're not a retro, they're a, they're a new right. Mm -hmm. So we hope with this kind of standards and the changes that will come to other policies, yeah. that we will meet all of those things that okay. Dan had up there, that we'll have better connected neighborhoods, that we right. won't have um, dead ends and, and um, those key things that we had in some neighborhoods. Cameron. So you can't really go anywhere but one way out. And that uh, we have connected, even if it's trails, not roads, right. Right. that we think of all those things now as part of a complete street. Um, and, and innovation might be that in areas where the roads are too narrow, and it's a, I mean, let's face it, every main road in Scarborough <coughs> was designed pretty much in colonial times. Oh, yeah. And they have now are doing 21st century duty. You take all of Black Point Road from, from Black Point all the way up, that was a colonial road. High Point Road was a colonial road. Horror Route 1 was a colonial road. Payne Road was a colonial road. All Horror of those. Road. And look what they are today. Those are our retro roads. So those are, I guess, what I would call our connectors. And there are others. There are other newer ones, but many of them are the old colonial roads. So, uh, and and there's a, it's, there are 
costly fixes to them. And, and we don't want, we're trying to minimize how we fix them and maximize what we can do mm -hmm. um, to make them fit all the things that Dan talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. many of them have poor bases to them. Oh, you yeah. really do yeah. a proper <laughs> job, you'd have to really dig them right out to give them new bases. I mean, they don't have a, a good, strong base. You, you know, what's interesting about this <coughs> job is that it brings out all the different comments about the transportation issues in this town. Yeah. Not just, I think this is terrific, um, but it also points out the lack of primary roads. All these neighborhoods have to draw, you know, feed into the yeah. very limited number of primary roads. Yeah. And then the other, the other problem, Dan, is I think the, uh, the connectivity between these developed neighborhoods. You know, um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure that's really <coughs> progressing the way we would like to see that happen. Mike, did you have something? Well, I was, I was just going to say that the, the, the benefit of the policy, from my from my perspective, <coughs> actually to your, to your comment about uh, you know gun stock or something, if, if I were to, I would still, with this policy, would still hold it up to to, to this to to see. I mean, as an example, um, not that it would rise, but gun stock may be a place where instead of doing an overlay, we we, we would put a sidewalk right. in where quadrant lane we wouldn't because that's a smaller you know. So it, I, I would expect that I would hold 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 every road up to this policy. Say, you know, where 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 or should we improve it? Could we do something different? Um, but the exciting thing about the policy for me is that it gives me somewhat of a template to work with. And you know, for we, we've we've kind of sniffed around this idea for years and years in various various committees and, and that sort of thing. But this this allows or this this really kind of puts uh, a little bit of a framework around. What sort of treatment a road rate, roadway would get under a major capital project? Um, you know, Gore Mode being the one we're working on right now. Uh, you know, with, with myself and Dan and Angela, and um, you know, it, it's uh, you know some pretty not that really it's, it's some pretty bold stuff with some of the things that we're we're talking about um, with with some of the bike lanes and some of the the wider pa uh, you know s bicycle paths with some of the uh, sidewalks and that sort of thing. Um, and, and this also starts the conversation about, okay, once, once you build these things, how do you, the next piece of this is how do you maintain them if you're building mm -hmm. sidewalks, uh, right. you know, snows in Maine and that sort of thing. So right. this, 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 this starts a pretty big dialogue <coughs> that, uh, that can go on for a while. And, and I think it's, you know, from my perspective, uh, looking at what we've, we've been working since the Transportation Committee began, talking about Gorm Road. And we started with um, we tr Dan trying for a grant with the schools, um, safe routes to safe schools, routes to schools yep. which we got, oh, yeah. which takes would take us down, I believe, to Sawyer Road. Correct. Right. Yeah. And we talked about if we could get to um, Maple Ave, there's a whole community of kids who could actually walk to school right. then, and we could. Reduce the amount of bus school bus traffic, right? And the amount of the amount of traffic of parents bringing their kids every day to school, and all. I mean, there's so kids much that can can go on over it that um, you know that we that we used to do years ago <coughs> that we can't do anymore because it's yeah. no longer safe. I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if the school thing is so much an infrastructure issue as a as a cultural issue at this point. But Part of it, but, right. but I, hear, I, I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, I, a couple of couple of more, I guess, I want to say poignant questions, but um, <laughs> what are the uh, what kind of additional costs can we expect out of implementing a, a policy like this? I mean, a ballpark. I mean, you're talking like adding two percent, five, ten. We don't know. We're you know, nothing because it's. You know, give me kind of a, ta a reference if you could. I think that's totally <laughs> too sensitive. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Getting to Gunstock earlier, that's a fun example. <laughs> 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 Doing something could be <laughs> striping it differently. You mm -hmm. know, that's like a really yeah. low cost right. Right. situation right. where you, instead of a 12 foot lane, it's 11, right. and you stripe it as a bike mm -hmm. yeah. shoulder, not just a shoulder. Mm -hmm. You know, that's next to nothing, I'll say, on the scale of spending money. And to very expensive project like we're talking about with Gorm Road, where we're. Um, you know, it's not finalized yet, but there's consideration for, you know, adding uh, basically an eastern trail-like path 
okay. parallel the Gorm Road, and then doing putting in some crosswalks, and you know, they're doing some major improvements, and that's right. where. So it, you know, it's a wide spectrum. So this policy wouldn't lock us into say necessary like every road needs to have a five foot no. wide bike path on the right hand right. side. No. Hash this because part of what I was reading was consistency in labeling, consistency in street signs, consistency in code, you know, all that other stuff. So if we codify something and say yeah. a bike path needs to be X number of feet wide and have X number of entrances, exits, that tends to lock us in right. with how we do things versus, like you said. Striping, you know, what, you know, taking a little extra of that shoulder and striping it a certain way or something. So, right. does this give us the flexibility to do either? Yes, it does, and it's okay. well, the uh, sort of squishy exceptions that I identified yeah. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. One of those squishy yeah. ones is, um, you know, town staff or town council exempt the project due to excessive or disproportionate costs to establish a list bikeway, walkway, you know, amenities. Yeah. Yeah in relation to the likely number of users. You know, that gets back to context where, yeah. not, not in Jean Marie's rural area, but other rural areas. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up, Dan. Uh, Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's just not enough homes in a yeah. city yeah. in Jean Marie's area. Yeah. Yeah. Things are so spread out. People aren't going to be walking a lot anyway. Yeah. You know, so you don't have a sidewalk out there. Okay, but okay. you might do something. There's a lot of breaking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thereby design to allow those types of case-by-case -case scenarios, yeah. yet framing it all under, you know, the, the complete streets umbrella, um, because, yeah. yeah, it would be completely crazy to say, yep, every new site, every new oh, yeah. goes in, we have a bike lane and sidewalks on both sides. Right. Um, and how do you address that in planning, though? Because if I'm a developer and I come in and I say, <laughs> right, but I say my bike path, I, you know, you're, you, planning says I want the bike path to be five feet wide, and you go, uh, that's cost prohibitive for me. Then you work it out and say, okay, then we stripe it or something. Is that the kind of a Things like that. I mean, I'm, that's where right now we have design expectations for new neighborhoods. So we have a starting point where okay. we say, well, most higher density residential areas, you're putting in a sidewalk because yep. everyone's doing it. And you're yep. connecting to the sidewalk along the main road when in a rural area, you know, where everything's spread out, they're and there's not much traffic, people are walking on the street anyway. It's a neighborhood street where there's not a lot of traffic, so it's cost prohibitive and probably redundant to mm -hmm. put in a sidewalk. Um, From a cost point of view for projects we manage, um, so long as we're able to include these sort of notions through the design process, and yes, we make some investment in design costs. Uh, we come out of that with at least a preliminary estimate from the engineers, and if it passes muster there, uh, we typically will go through the bid process those costs are broken out, so you can mm -hmm. make a, an informed decision. Is this worth the investment or not? Yeah. Uh, we often handle those as options, you know, that they're kind of add-ons, but let's see what the number is. But, and if, but if we codify this one, that doesn't prohibit us from doing that same procedure, correct? Absolutely. It just, no. it just <coughs> makes our expectations. I, I, I think if everybody could look at the, the tentative, the beginning plan that Woodman and Kerr has been working on for Gorham Road, I mean, they've broken it out into six phases right. because there's such diversity in, in that segments one on that road that, that, huh? that, that they have to be treated different. Some areas you can put a five-foot bike lane, which I think is mandated by state, is it not? It's it's for an official bike lane. For an official one. But because of the houses and where right, they're situated, you can't do it. they've had to look at adjustments and they couldn't stick to, you know, it's got to be this wide. Uh, and so also that helps the cost. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Projecting the, the, that same cost to the town over, you know, if you were just to come through and do that one project right. in one year, that's a huge expense and not really realistic. Or does it make more sense and is it more feasible to do it in three sections or six sections? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I support this. I think this is great. But one question I had as I kind of follow the conversation on Gorham Road. And so we think of the sort of bike paths and other things. One of the things they are contemplating, which I don't know where it sits and give some thought, but they're, they're talking about where there's not enough room to try to merge the bike path and the traffic lanes all into one. And I think we just need to think about that because mm -hmm. it, my experience has been motorists and bikers don't always play well together. No, that's <laughs> right. Um, so I, I think that should be something we should carefully mm -hmm. consider where that's really the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather somehow try to keep 
you know, the, the vehicle separated in a safety right. zone from walkers and others, especially if you're going to have kids riding bikes and other things. But merging them all into one mm. lane, I think, causes trouble. Dan, uh, Shore Road in Cape Elizabeth yeah. is an interesting yeah. place where they've, I, my brother lives right off from Shore Road, and um, it, it, what they've done there is very interesting, and have we looked at that? Because that is used that's used by walkers, bikers, it's a crazy, Jogging. dangerous road, but they've managed to do that path yeah. along the way, and I believe they let people bike on it if they choose to yeah. do so and whatnot. I mean, I mean I'm just, yeah. Similar to what yeah. okay. I was being talked about for the I missed that to second to meeting, yeah. Sawyer Road, you know, the yeah, right. road right. closer to the school campus. Right trying to do a wider surface that goes offline, you know, probably on the other side of that big ditch. That yeah, because in Cape they have just a little like strip Cape. of grass in between, but it's not a formal yeah, sidewalk, it's just a yeah. flat path that's been paved, basically. Right. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you brought up was the, like the, uh, the interconnections, and one of the examples you gave was uh, broad turn to, to Payne Road. Yeah. I'm assuming, and just asking for clarification, I'm assuming that when we, when we do something like that, we're taking to account the, the increased impact on that secondary road that you're connecting to just kind of in the planning process. Okay. But yeah. for instance, because more traffic would go on Payne Road. However, I will say honestly that the history of the town has not been to do that. It just grew like Topsy. And so oh, yeah. those colonial roads, as I mentioned them, just keep getting more houses and more businesses. So it's, this whole thing is to, be, to right. actually take a thoughtful look right. at those things when we do them. Uh, so that we actually hold it up and ask the questions. Right. That doesn't mean we're going to do everything on here, right. but we're going to well, look at them all and things. say, "This is this. this we have yeah. we checked this out, and is are we gonna, is this what we're going to recommend?" So it kind of sets a framework for that. Just one other observation. I remember being a bit uh, surprised by Dan's taking this position, but it made perfect sense. We've, we've done a number of pretty important intersection improvements along Route One, I guess Parkway down the Dunston section. And especially we've maximized the right of way. There's no more room to do anything else. And so Route One is conceded at this point to the mm. to, to cars. Mm. And we didn't even factor that into our design. It, we tried to do some pedestrian improvements, crosswalks yeah. in strategic locations, but from a bike lane, there's just no more no room to, to put it at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood of, you know, another lane in either direction is simply not gonna happen. Correct. So um, kind of a reference point, I guess. Is there any empirical data to support the claims of reduced congestion, health safety, that kind of stuff, or is it more just a, a concept of if we implement these things, that's the desired outcome? Is there a yeah, study you can look at to say, like, yeah, there's we've had X number of traffic incidents, yeah. like, like yeah. we have that data? Available? Yeah, there's a, a whole um, organization that kind of focuses on these types of transportation improvements. And so, you know, some of the background for this presentation and came from there. Well, I can get you a lot. I'm sure there's kind of yeah, sure the national data yeah. out there, for sure. I'm yeah. wondering more focused and local, like we've had, you know, five pedestrian bike, inter or, you know, car bike incidences yeah. that have, you know, not that you want to wait till something bad happens, but right. if there's something that you can connect a real, a real need to, to say, okay, now is really the time to do this because we are at maximum point now, if you know what I mean? Like we're so congested that we're running into each other. This is time critical now to, to, to make this stuff happen. So is there anything like that out there? Yes, and Woodward and Curran gave us, what we said, it's, it's local. They, they did a street there where they made it the traffic flowing. Oh, here. in Woolwich. Yeah, Woolwich. There are some other examples oh. yeah. locally, huh. maybe not in Scarborough, but um, in other areas. The first one that yeah. oh, my mind is um, Route 1. Route 1. That project uh -huh. um, would fall under. Yeah. You know, and, and Bill Bray was sitting right here at our table and done traffic studies here in Scarrow, and he did has done one for the Oak Hill area, and we know the high crash incident areas, and we've been working to mitigate those with the design that we're doing. So yes, we do have the local, some actual local data, and for each project that's coming in, I assume we would be doing that kind of thing except maybe something really minor. But for a major change, we would be looking, doing some traffic studies. 
the, the we see what the impact is going to be, and often we make the developer do both. So yeah. From a from a public works perspective, the the real driver or the opportunity to do these is going to be more driven by the fact of bad bad drainage issues or right. road surface mm -hmm. issues, and so that's that's the point where you take a look at these these sorts of things and say, do these amenities make sense? Mm -hmm. um, you know. Gorm Road. The real the real driver behind Gorm Road is is uh, is, is poor poor vertical and, and horizontal alignment road surface, uh, poor drainage. Um, one of the other big projects I have on my mind is uh, the East Grand area. Mm. Um, you know the driver behind that is the fact that it's a 50 plus year old drainage system yeah. that's completely failed um, and, and pavement surface. So you know the from a from a, from a municipal standpoint. Um, you know the, the the real driver, the real route is is is, is still drainage and pavement pavement surface, um, but it, it also allows us to hold hold this policy up and, and take a look at it and say, you know, this is do we replace in kind or do we not? Um, and, and if we don't, what what sorts of things do we do based on this policy? Based on you know the data that you're talking about, uh, which. We have plenty of crash data. The, the police department keeps all that sort of stuff. We can take a look at that. We can take a look and, and see, you know, for this for this classification of road, what is the typical modern standard for it, uh, countrywide, and so forth. So there are a number of ways to to, to back into into what you're saying as far as, as as far as whether we do these sorts of things or not. So. Roger, so, Roger, do you have something? Yeah, just just I was just going to ask Dan, um, but I, I, I want to. I think what Mike is saying just now makes sense. I mean, this is all going to be driven by <coughs> the needs, you know, the, the drainage and all this other stuff. But I was just kind of curious, Dan, um, do you see any of this at some point in the future applying to Route 1? You know, I know you talked about OKL and Dunson, but what about the main artery? Do you, do you, can well, Route 1, there's already a policy to, when a new project comes in, to connect the sidewalks to the mm -hmm. existing yeah. Route 1 sidewalk. So yeah. that's happened kind of incrementally with development projects and then the town has come along and been strategic about filling in gaps and, and improving connections. Um, so yeah, I think Route 1 is one of the many contexts that we have to contend with. Um, so I would consider it part of this kind of policy, part of this discussion for sure. It's more than anything though, it's connecting the neighborhoods to Route 1, just given the destinations that exist along Route 1. Um, and that's been done successfully, like on Maple Avenue, you know, what, eight or so years ago, that, that was a great sidewalk connection out to Route 1 and mm -hmm. some other places. But, um, you know, in places, parts of Route 1 aren't walkable at all, so you don't focus on them. But around Oak Hill and around Dunstan, those have real opportunity for what's around Route 1 to connect to it better. Um, and you know, probably if we had better interconnections to Hannaford Drive and other places, people would prefer to walk along those roads. I mean, Route 1 is you walk along it more out of necessity than desire. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, say the network right builds there. more, people are going to choose to stay away from Route 1 unless they have to mm -hmm. go near it just because it's so auto, it's so imposing as yeah, a road to yeah. walk along. Well, I I remember, uh, and Bill Gray may recall this, um, the Transp Transportation Committee about 10 years ago, then, and I think that I recall them saying there shouldn't even be sidewalks along Route 1 because yeah, the traffic is so... That. Remember that? I do. The traffic is... And, and the sidewalk was so close to the road, even though you had the guardrail there, it, it just wasn't, you know, so... I just wanted to add, and I don't know if it's part of this policy, but something that I think probably should run in parallel with it. For me, anyway, the aesthetics matter as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're, yeah. not, they're not the kind of practical things, the nuts and bolts that make roads work and make them safe. But I, nonetheless, I think they're important mm -hmm. in terms of a, looking at it comprehensively and, and the whole notion of green infrastructure in terms of how we handle stormwater management. So I think there's some companion pieces maybe a bit different than this. And I know staff has been kicking around. Yeah. Um, and I, I called in. Uh, about a week ago, just so before Christmas, to talk to him about the, the job that's happened in at Cash at uh, Thornton Heights. If any of you have oh, heard yeah. of oh, yeah. what they've done with the, the the rain garden kind of concept for storm drainage, they've got sidewalks, they've changed the lighting, they've hew and they put planting. 
Right. And they've humanized the streetscape of Route 1. Right. And that's what a lot of our committee has talked about along with Dom's mm -hmm. idea of greening of the area. It helps right. control traffic and slow yes, down. It does. And, yes. and it makes a big difference. So a lot of people think that's real, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's vital to right. making it a safer, more usable environment. And environmentally. Yeah. 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 And I think that um, with that, I hate to do it, but we only have about four minutes before the council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really kind of good note, and I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, this is a great step forward for us that really culminates a lot of work over the last decade. Um, and I think it's a very positive move for the town. So I do want to thank everyone for participating, and we'll see you at 7 o'clock at the company. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some things haven't changed.